Welcome once again to a Country First conversation. This has been quite the week for the Republican Party and Country First. We are continuing the Country First conversations with former Congressman Denver Riggleman. He's an expert in online conspiracy theories. Thanks for joining and please visit countryfirst.com and choose country over party. All right, everybody, thanks for uh, joining us again on a uh, Country First conversation. I'm super stoked about this one because uh, we got my good friend Denver Riggleman, and Denver's awesome. He's got a great military background. He's, you know, I served with him in the House. And in Denver, where I really got to know you was on the uh, China Task Force. And I got to tell a quick story where, you know, we're in there, we're all, we all kind of know each other, but when you work on, you know, a thing like the task force together, you get to know each other well. And when, when you started talking to Denver, I'm like, oh man, this dude's way smarter than me on this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, um, but you know, you came with such a good, a good background about things like space. You and I kind of connected on that and yes. trying to work with that. But, you know, the big area where you're, I think, not just flourishing, but I think you're providing a really good support for the party and, and for that is, is in misinformation and, you know, what's been going on. So first off, thanks for doing doing this. And, and I want to just turn it to you, kind of open it up with, I guess, first off, just give me your thoughts on, you know, what happened with Liz Cheney. And then we'll kind of get into the misinformation stuff. But I want to I want to give you a chance to kind of address some of that that happened. You know, I almost think. uh you know, with Liz and Adam, you know, I compare it to you a lot. And by the way, thank you for that compliment on China. You know, you know, when we were in there, my background in the Pentagon was I was actually studying critical infrastructure, cyber defense, and cyber offense oh, yeah. uh, in Asia. So that's why it was so exciting to do the China Task Force with you. But that does actually dovetail into misinformation based on networks and how you pass information. And I find it amazing with Liz, Adam, just like you've been out there talking about consistency of message and consistency of facts. You've been very good at that. I think what we had with Liz is I almost feel like, and Adam, me and you could have this discussion. I almost feel like she got to a point that she was like, I can't, like, I, I can't toe the line on something that's so, I would say, provably false, that's not based in facts. And this sort of cascading effect from stop the steal to election integrity to a former president that's still lobbying you know, verbal grenades and, and disinformation ammunition, you know, over the walls at Mar-a-Lago, you know, either hiding behind the walls or hiding behind digital walls mm. and then using their spokespeople, you know, out front to push this kind of nonsense. And I think, you know, I think Liz just said I had enough and I'm still, and Adam, I know you were too, I, I'm still a little bit shocked that there was such a hard switch from McCarthy, you know, a few days after the insurrection and his strong words on the floor to, you know, pretty much pushing Liz out in a way that was very fast. I think it was reckless. Uh, but I also believe, you know, at this point that they pretty much set up the messaging for 2022. Yeah. And I think the reason he did that flip, Adam, wasn't had nothing to do with his belief systems or integrity, but polling and fundraising. And when you're looking at the ability to weaponize and monetize insanity like you do with QAnon-based conspiracy theories or New World Order-based conspiracy theories, I think you're, you're, you're sort of, I think, navigating a pretty tricky route if you're trying to satisfy a base that seems to be willing to give you money for insanity by pushing people out that are facts-based. I think, I think that's a dangerous road to go down. Yeah, and I think, you know, the interesting thing is, is I feel like we've lost the definition of leadership. You know, when when you and I were kids and you learn about leadership or you're going through some of that, you know, Air Force training that's boring, but they talk about leadership. And, and you know, nowhere does leadership say, hey, find out what your people want, even if it's wrong, and just do that. You know, it's always like, you know, how do you influence <laughs> yeah. people? How do you move them along? And and I think so, you know, when we when we think about things like misinformation, you know, I, I look back to when I was a kid and I, I remember, you know, the whole U.N. black helicopter stuff, the the Christians that were going to be put in the FEMA camps and beheaded. Um, you know, 2015, there was the whole Jade Helm that I mean, even the governor yeah. of Texas activated the Texas State Guard, which isn't the National Guard, but, you know, it's like kind of the Civil Air Patrol for the National Guard. And. Be, because nobody had the courage to just say this is this is crap. It's just much easier to to reaffirm what people already believe. But you know now with the internet, it's getting really dangerous. And so, 
what's let me ask you, what's the first, you know, conspiracy theory you remember hearing when you were young? And maybe if you can address kind of, you know, where are we at today? How, how did we get to this moment where 70 percent of our base believes the election was stolen and, you know, that there was widespread fraud and all that kind of stuff? And, and, you know, also that the government's run by pedophiles, I guess. So, you know, it's funny when you said about the pedophiles and the Satanists. Remember, I'm a little bit older than you, right? I was born in 70. Man, right? you are so old. Jeez. I'm old. I mean, I'm like I'm like freaking parchment, right? Yeah. And so I remember um, 1980s, and I think some people remember this. The first thing I remember is the Satanist cult conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you remember this stuff where, yeah. you know, what they said was that there's, there's, there's Satanists all over America running these sort of patchwork in the woods type of camps and that was used it was really scary at the time because people actually believed you know there were satanists running around uh, taking children now this is the 80s (laughs) right and and what's amazing is that when you go and look at you know and 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 again we can go back to anti-semitism and blood libel but when you look at this thing what you just talked about the pedophiles you know Mm. is you know a batch of republicans a majority of republicans you know that are really trump supporters believing that there's a blood drinking cult, uh, adrenochrome harvesters out there, you know, and, and Hillary Clinton was the start of that. I, you know, I got to scratch my head, but you know, when you look about, talk about what, you know, I, but I was only 13 or 14, right? I, I'm, I'm 51 and it's hard for me to believe that there's adults that would believe such nonsense. But, you know, I, I was also back in the time of In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy, which you know about my book, Bigfoot is Complicated, about oh, yeah. all that disbelief, the belief systems, was that, you know, again, that Bigfoot and UFOs was really huge back then, too. So it was really about Satanists and UFOs and, you know, these conspiracy theories that there's these bizarre government camps and that the Satanists were being used to take children. I mean, that was really a scary thing for me back in, you know, middle school, you know, that I believe yeah. that stuff, obviously – I think I've moved on from middle school, you know, intelligence level or knowledge level, but that's that's the first thing I remember. But it's very weird to see the parallels today and also that a lot of these memes are baked in. Yeah. And that's what scares me, buddy, is that disinformation becomes real. And when that becomes real, when you actually believe there's a good against evil thing happening and no matter what you do, it, it, it's, it's rationalized by the fact that you're fighting for, for good and it's apocalyptic and messianic, that gets scary. Yeah. What, now, explain what you mean by these memes are baked in. I've heard you use that before. Can you g- kind of go into a little detail on that? Because that's always very interesting to me, especially when you look at, like, Pepe the Frog and you see kind of how that stuff <laughs> yeah. came. And I, 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 so go into some of that a little bit because I think it's intriguing. Sure. Well, there, there's, the, there's the memes like Pepe when you're talking about the memes that sort of become baked in as, as a symbol of something. And then yeah. there's social memes. And the best thing I can say is when you looked at 1947 and 1958, if you think about these two years, and this is the difference between sort of like a social meme or a meme that's used to pass a message or to coordinate. When you're looking at social memes, after 1947 and the Roswell incident, right, in the newspapers, UFO sightings exploded, right, Adam? They they just exploded. More people saw UFOs than ever before after 1947 because you have newspapers and you have the metastasization of memeology or or the metastasization of a meme that becomes baked into society. Hmm. 1958, Jerry Crew, massive newspaper articles about reporting that he saw, right, Bigfoot prints and cast them. We found out that they were actually faked by a guy named Ray Wallace down the line. But at that point, after 1958, Bigfoot sightings exploded, right? Hmm. So if you look at history, when you have something like a Roswell or something like Bigfoot sightings, which are, you know, absurd on its face, However, that creates a social meme or a baked-in belief system that's very hard to get rid of. You're seeing this baked-in New World Order QAnon thing based on the fact that when you talk about Satanists, when you talk about these years of memes that have sort of you know, percolated through our society, now there's a belief system that there's got to be pedophiles in the Democratic Party that worship yeah. Satan. There's a belief system that there's a New World Order and that globalists are trying to take over. And when you start actually putting all these together – and some might have tiny bits of truth, right? There might be, but the issue is they wrap these tiny nuggets of truth, and underneath that is the sort of the social meme that something that is absurd on its face is taken as fact. And my my problem with Q, my problem with New World Order or COVID nineteen eighty four or anti vaxxing is that these memes become baked in, and it doesn't matter that Trump's doing it. What matters is now people believe it and they've identified the enemy. 
And it's a good against evil issue now, and it's emotional, not factual, and it's very hard to break that cycle of belief. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So, like, when, when we talk about the election not being stolen, you know, I'll, I'll if I get engaged with people on this, it's it's amazing how many people still, you know, mention <laughs> it's, it's the amazing. the ballots that were pulled out from under the table, even though that was debunked. And, you know, all this was debunked. They don't believe it, even when you say it's debunked. But then there's also, if you do find an area where there's fraud, you know, maybe at January 6th, there was somebody associated with Antifa among the 15,000 people that weren't. Exactly. There could be one. Yeah. And now yeah. all of a sudden they say, see, that's proof. And in a 10 second attention span, it's tough to come back and say, well, yeah, there may have been one there, but oh, well, you know, you said it was an Antifa, right? And, and we've gotten into <laughs> yeah. these incredible tribes. So you become, I think, kind of a QAnon expert, and I think a lot of people know Q and kind of what that is. When did you wake up to it? And and secondarily, I want to ask you, uh, you know, uh, HBO just did their documentary where they, I think it was pretty compelling that they found Q, this guy Ron Watkins potentially, but uh, even if you show, I think, a QAnon subscriber that, they will still believe Q, because I think there, in, in many cases, there are people that in their mind know this isn't true, but it feels good to believe it because you belong to a tribe. What do you think about that? Well, that's, yeah, that's, that, is the, that is the actual sort of tribe-specific good against e evil belief system that you sort of get wrapped into. And when you talk about Q or you talk about Stop the Steal or you talk about the Janu January 6th insurrection, all that is really based on this good against evil mythology that's based on one person who's been sort of blessed Mm. with the singular ability to push people forward. And as you know, and you've talked to them, it's this messianic conspiracy theories of good against evil that are based on that Donald Trump was put here by God. Yeah. It's, and, and that's the biggest, um, I would say that is the number one reason I get for these belief systems from evangelicals and, and friends and family, Adam, like you, right? I've lost friends and family over yeah. this. And you wonder, you know, I try to speak facts to them like you did, but they already have a belief system that's baked in, back to memes, right, of good against evil, that Democrats represent some overarching evil, and that their tribe, the Republicans, whatever that might be, right, has been blessed to have President Trump to lead the party in what he says is truth. Mm. And, I, and, and breaking that is just so gosh darn difficult. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it happened to me on, on family members that are so close. I don't want to mention it here, but me and you could talk about offline that are so close to me. Um, that they just said, listen, you're a traitor to your country. Mm. And, and, and it's because, not because I presented facts. Mm. That, that had nothing to do with it. The issue was that I betrayed President Trump. That's right, yeah. Uh, that is the issue that you have, Adam. And that's why what you're doing is so important as an elected member. And your question about when I first heard about Q, as you know, I got beat after I officiated a same-sex wedding and then started to identify conspiracy theories as they were coming after me. Because what happened after my same-sex wedding is that they paid people to go to churches to say I was funded by George Soros to change the sexual orientation of children. <laughs> um, and I was like, where is this coming from? And I saw it was baseline Q, and this was late 2019, early 2020, and that's probably why, Adam, as you know, me and you are one of only a few co-sponsors on the QAnon resolution. Yeah. And that's because people kept looking at me and scoffing me, saying this is BS, this is bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. We. we this, these are just dark corner crazies. And I'm like, no, this is a massive movement of radical language and a messianic or apocalyptic belief theory of good against evil. And what's going to happen is going to cause violence. And that just comes from my ISIS, al-Qaeda, Taliban days, which you have a lot of experience with and what I saw with radicalized language. But, yeah, I first, you know, I first really started to look at Q back in probably late 2019. That's about I, I think that's about the time I uh, I started kind of wait. You know, I'd heard a lot of these conspiracy theories, but. It was, uh, you know, we were basically early to the game for members of Congress, yes. but late to the game we, generally. Adam, we were very early. <laughs> I know. I <laughs> think there's, we're still waiting. Like, come on, you know, yeah. like we're playing this yeah. game of life, and we still got a couple of cars that need somebody needs to pick up and play. Um, <laughs> Please, so, yeah. you know, the, the interesting thing you were mentioning, you know, about the messianic side, and so, you know, as a Christian myself, one of the things that I've really started to take on is, you know, after I voted to impeach Trump, for instance, and whether anybody disagrees or agrees, whatever, it was a vote of conscience. And when you had Franklin Graham, you know, Billy Graham's kid, this like stalwart of Christianity, the evangelical who said, I wonder how many pieces of silver 
you know, Nancy Pelosi paid to these 10 to betray Trump. I mean, you're, you're saying, in essence, Trump is Jesus Christ. We're Judas yeah. because we thought an insurrection was bad. Yes. And, and, I, and again, I, I, I tried to explain this to somebody when that happened to you guys. And I was like, Denver, that, that's, that's really crazy. Tell me how this would happen. I said, and, and listen, I, there comes a time, and, and it's, it's in Islam, right? It's in, it's in Christianity, where if you believe you're doing something correct or something that's blessed, um, there's not a whole lot that you can do, even if it seems wrong, to pursue the kingdom of God. That's right. Or to, to get there. And, you know, so I, I, I find it amazing that just like I saw earlier today, Adam, and if you mind me talking about you a little bit. Sure, I, you know, please, but, as long as it's nice. Uh, no, I, I saw today where a guy wanted, and I don't know what I can say on the podcast, you guys can bleep it out, but I saw a guy wanted to call you bitch as many times as Yeah, week, yeah, that song's possible, been stuck right? in my head now. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, the thing was, is when, when I saw that, right, I laughed, but then I looked at his profile. Yeah. And it said he was a Christian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember the word bitch being in the Bible at any point that I, don't I can either. remember. I don't either. Um, and, and so I think we're at a point, buddy, that, that it's not about Christianity. It's about the tribe. And I think the fact that Franklin Graham would come after you, to me, sort of de- delegitimizes his mission. Uh, but we also have to have grace. And I think we also have to forgive. we got to understand that Frank, Franklin Graham is corporeal matter. He's flesh and blood. He's just a dude. Mm-hmm. And when you think about that, the grace that, Adam, you have or that I have is that, hey, it's just a guy, and we forgive you. I think that's the real spirit of Christianity, not the fact that he called you a Judas. And, and, and because of what you said in the analogy, is that by calling you a Judas, is somehow that Trump is a Christ-like figure. I mean, you mm-hmm. be, got to be shitting me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's insane. That it, actually borders on insanity, and, and it scares the hell out of me. It does me too, and you know, I was I, there was a, a pastor in Israel that I always followed, and, and mainly because he I, I think he's somehow associated with Israeli intelligence, Christian pastor, but he would always kind of ju- like I would hear about stuff going on in the Middle East from him before it hit the mainstream news, so I followed him, and you know, and he at the start of COVID was pretty sane. He was like, you know, get vaccinated. It's not the mark of the beast. It's not the end times. But then during the election, you know, the contested part right up until January 6th, the dude kept prophesying. He was like, you know, God told me in my prayers that December 20th, Trump's going to descend, you know, from heaven, the heavens upon us all and, you know, be be reinaugurated. And there were so many people prophesying. And if you believe these pastors and their ability to, you know, prophesy, you, you would almost be an idiot not to go on January 6th if that's what God is telling you to do. I mean, it's, 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 and that's where the failure, I think, in our party has been too, is in the church. Well, and I, and buddy, I, obviously, you know, I agree with that. And, you know, this is, there is an evangelical problem here. When I was, um, so when I first came out against Q and, you know, it was before that church convention, by the way, <laughs> you know, I got kicked out of the church convention with only 2,500 people. It wasn't even, it was one of the most bizarre things I've ever went through. Um, <laughs> I remember um, uh, I, I had somebody actually tell me through biblical prophecy um, that I was going to lose and Trump was going to win, and that the reason I was going to lose is because I had committed such an evil sin against God. Mm. And I remember, too, that people would send me YouTube videos of uh, biblical prophecy, you know, some dude sitting in a truck in the middle of a cornfield, right, somehow getting, you know, directed messages from the Holy Spirit right. about – Trump winning on January 6th and the fact that Biden was part of the pedophile cabal. And this was being preached in churches, buddy. This is not, you know, this is, this is your Bible study groups. Yeah. This is that metastasization of, of, you know, socialized memes and disinformation that gets baked in. And I know we keep going back to that, but my, again, you, just like with the Israel, just like with the Christian pastor in Israel, talking about biblical prophecy, this messianic good against evil is only increasing in intensity mm. because now they believe they're being persecuted. And that persecution comes in the form of deplatforming, you know, and I know yeah. I, I, you thought I was going to say something worse, but I'm not. It's, it, it is, it's deplatforming. It's they're coming after our Christian belief systems by going after Trump. They're going after my belief in, in biblical prophecy. Uh, my biblical prophecy is validated because why would they go after Trump so much if Satan didn't hate him? Right. Is right. that, Satan is mobilizing the forces, and I hear that all the time. This is this is this is data driven, but it's also anecdotal. I, I get it 
to my face. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you do too, Adam, and mm -hmm. we know. And the thing is, is how do you break that cycle? I don't know if it's blunt force trauma with facts. I don't know if we need a center for disinformation defense. We need something, but it, it does come back to the courage of leaders, Adam, and the courage to say this is this is not right. And, and you, you've reaped the whirlwind because of what you said. <laughs> Liz has reaped the whirlwind. I've had my own issues, as you know. It was brutal for me. Um, but you know what? I, I'm going to continue to, to to fight with facts, and I think where me and you are also heavily related is in our oath to the Constitution as, as Air Force bubbles. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the I think you have this service. I think you have a DNA service gene that you can't get rid of, and you also have a DNA facts gene. And I would I would I would humbly submit that, like myself, you hate bullies, and by God, we are not going to we're not going to bend the knee to anybody. That's and right. I think that is a great trait to have, if. <laughs> You don't want to move up in leadership for the Republican Party. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, let me right. – you know, the other interesting thing is like, you know, I, I've said – and I'm not trying to be dramatic, but like, you know, we, you know, as congressmen will give speeches and tear up, you know, when we talk about Memorial Day and we talk about how great it is that, you know, people are willing to die for this country. It's tragic, but it's, it's an honor to – and then we're not willing to give up our jobs – you know, for the same cause. Right. We're not in combat, but you're still defending the Constitution. And, you know, you just created the cardinal sin of, you know, officiating a, a same sex wedding, which led to all of these, uh, you know, conspiracies about you. Yes. And, and and you just you just did somebody, you know, a nice thing. Somebody you liked, a friend of yours and, and Two people uh, that worked on my campaign. And that's became right. Close friends. That's yeah. right. So let me ask you, because um, we have about six or so minutes left. Um, where do we go? I mean, I know, I, you know, I, I get asked all the time, like, you know, what's the answer? How do you do it? How do you fix this? And, you know, I think country first is a huge kind of start to that. It gives people a home where they can come and share these ideas and hear from others. And we have a lot that we're going to roll out in terms of this becoming basically a social movement, not just limited to Republicans, but the people that say, we want to be able to talk to each other again. And, and, uh, and, you know, have conversation that I think the country, frankly, is desperate for, but the leaders don't know it. So that we just go around and still throw, you know, poop at each other and and uh, make armpit, you know, pass gas noises because that's what, you know, entertains. And I think people are right. desperate for some some real conversation. But look, like I said, you know, the 74 million people, my base voters that tell me the election was stolen, I have come around to not being upset at them anymore and not blaming them because I realize every one of their leaders is telling them that or at least not telling them differently. So, frankly, it makes sense that they believe it. And that's why, you know, Liz speaking out, me speaking out, you speaking out can make a difference. But here's the bajillion dollar question that, you know, you'll get a bajillion if you got the answer right. But how does how do we deprogram people from things like Q from whatever the next iteration of Q is? And how do we as a party or as a country, you know, confront this issue of misinformation on the Internet and uh, and just, you know, grow up and get back to doing politics the right way. And I'll try to do this quick. And, and, and I'll, first, I want to say that, you know, crazy is not party specific, right? No, I, true. I mean, and there's a, there's certainly we're seeing data on the far left that's starting to, to mirror the far right as far as, you know, using um, coded memes and things like that. And and I think it's a 15 to 20 percent quotient on each side that's going to be very difficult to reach. And I don't want to be pessimistic, but I do believe that there, there is a certain portion we are not going to reach. Mm -hmm. And and what I'm trying to figure out, whether, you know, I'm the chief strategist for the Network Contagion Research Institute. I started my, my intelligence company now based on algorithmic, you know, sort of solutions to disinformation. Um, but I but the optimistic part is this. I think you're doing it, Adam. Mm -hmm. I think I've done it. I think Liz is doing it. I think. By certain people standing up and saying there's an issue here, I think that's the first step. As far as massive deprogramming, the type of courage that's going to take isn't just from leaders like you, me, Liz, or even higher, right? People that are higher in the, in the congressional food chain or, or higher in the executive food chain. There's nobody higher in the executive food chain, but people that maybe have more push and pull. The issue is, is that we're going to have a tough time because this has to start from the ground up too. Hmm. And I don't know how you get committees um, to – or committee leads or people like in – remember all the censures? I think, Adam, you know a little bit about censures. Yeah, I know a and, touch about them, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, you know, and I do too, right? 
is all is that this is actually also a people problem on a massive scale at the party level where people are taking advantage of individuals for yeah. grift and to move up the, the, the power ladder. And I don't, it's going to take a, a people who are willingly able or have the courage to break away from their tribe. We can push facts and we can push information and we can tell them they're being lied to, but until their peer groups break out of the echo chamber or they break out of that echo chamber from their peer groups, I think we're going to have a very tough time. And I think we almost need to, at a very young level, middle school or whatever, we need to talk. I think we need to teach about sourcing and critical thinking and what disinformation looks like and, and how to tell fact from fiction and, and all the things, you know, research, uh, you know, methodologies. And I think that's a start. I think it's a start by having some kind of center where we can aggregate private public partnership data. I think it's a start. Where we have leaders like you and Liz and out there, just elected officials, just going against the party with facts and truth and courage. That is important. That is incredibly important. But until we have more people willing to join, we're going to have a massive subset of both parties in the fringes that believe things that are apocalyptic, messianic, baked in, or have been memed into a way where they can't get out. And that's why I think we need to start now. I think we're doing the right things, but I believe this is such a slog. Um, and I think we're at a peak with social media where it's going to be very difficult to break all those, you know, sort of identified social media echo chamber suck fests, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're just, those trons are just being directly injected into their frontal lobe. <laughs> that's a, that's a tough thing. And, and I don't want to be pessimistic, Adam, but, but I, I, I don't know if I've been this worried in a long time about the mass of people that believe these things. I, I agree. Uh, you know, for me, the, the, the concern is democracy is fragile. You know, January 6th was a bad day. Democracies aren't defined by bad days. They're defined by how they come back from that. And to watch, you know, my party turn around and embrace the man that was on life support politically after January 6th, throw the paddles on him and, and you know, deem him leader of the party again. It's, it's like, what are you guys thinking? I think there's so many people, you know, you and I being involved in warfare and stuff like that, we recognize the real danger. There's so many people that just, either they don't take personal ownership, even as a member of Congress in the future of this country, or they don't care, or you know, they're too dumb to know. I don't know. But, you know, Michael Wood, who, who ran in, in Texas, oh, yeah. has become a great friend. And, and thanks to everybody that helped his campaign. I mean, he he didn't win, but he, he was able to talk to millions and millions of people, and he's better known from that than probably any other candidate in that race. But he's, he always said something was stuck with me, with, which stuck with me, which was, you know, Americans have a raw and noble patriotism that basically, to paraphrase, Donald Trump has taken advantage of and abused. And I think people need to wake up to that. It's going to happen from the ground. We can say the right words, but until people take ownership over their own information and what they believe. All we can do is scream in the wind. You got to take ownership yeah, for yourself. We just can't get confused with patriotism and nativism, right? That's right. And that that's a tough thing. And, you know, Michael went through the ringer on that. And I hope that, Adam, I, there, you know, gosh, me and your military sayings, we know hope is not a viable course of action. Mm -hmm. But we certainly hope that if we if we get out there and start saying good things that people follow and it really comes down to a baseline of this. Are people brave enough to break away from the tribe when they know something is wrong? And do we have a problem with a party that refuses to, to, to help with that? And I, and I think we do. And, I, and that's an issue I have with the GOP right now. Yeah. And I know that you're at peace with what you're saying, even if it's hard. I'm at peace. And uh, I'll be willing to pay the price. You know, we, we have been our whole yes. lives. So, well, listen, Denver, distill, how's the distillery, man? What's the what's the what's the whiskey of the day? Well, I think uh, we just got done distilling bourbon yesterday, and I think mm -hmm. I have that advantage, I think, over you, Adam, is that if I think it's really bad, I just go over to my barrel house and I thief some whiskey out of a barrel and <laughs> take a dip. You, know? you have like a big so, ladle you just pour over yourself? Yeah, it's a, yeah, just a ladle. Yeah, just like a syrup yeah. you know, that I pour over. Yeah, that, that uh, you know, it's fantastic. But the distillery's great. My life is great. I'm a new grandpa. Oh, I mean, it's great. just life is something, Adam. And, but you know, I'm here uh, all the time to help in, in your battle that you're going through. And and uh, I just really appreciate all that you're doing, Adam. And, and thanks for being my friend too. I mean, it's been it's been quite the slog the last year. And uh, in watching what's happening to you now in there, I wish I was there with you. Well, I appreciate it. I got to come visit the distillery soon. And 
Uh, again, Denver Riggleman, author of Bigfoot It's Complicated. You can follow him at, at Rep Riggleman on Twitter. Follow him because he's got some good stuff. And uh, of course, follow the Country First and, you know, both on yep. uh, Instagram, Country Twitter, first, everything buddy. else. That's right, buddy. Well, listen, Denver, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for spending some time with us. Thanks for uh, enlightening us with your expertise. And we'll catch you soon, brother. You got it, Adam. And you take care and stay safe. You bet. See ya. Thank you for joining. We invite you to visit the website countryfirst.com. Make sure you subscribe to receive all the latest updates. All of our podcasts can be found on our YouTube channel. Make sure you get a chance to watch and share on your social media channels today as well. My name is Greg Reidenauer. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time as we put country over party.